Hello. How are you? Good to meet you. You too. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Always amazed that it actually works. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Are you out in <laughs> California now? Yeah, I've been out here uh, since May. I moved out of my apartment in New York. So I've just been been out here trying to figure out what's next. You were born in California. Yeah. So it's kind of close to where you were born, where you're living now? Actually with my parents. So oh, I've okay. been, yeah. Okay. Uh, for the time being, it's actually, it's been really nice um, for the most part. I feel very lucky to have had this time to be with my parents. And and as you said, I've, I've been out in and out a little bit. I went to the East Coast for, I guess, a couple months on this stuff with Pittsburgh and to go back to New York. I had a couple things to do there in Boston also. Besides that, I've just been kind of trying to, to work on some personal projects and keep my head afloat. When did you figure out you liked classical music? I do actually vividly remember my my parents taking me to, or my mom took me to, concert uh, by a piano trio. I think when I was four, maybe when I had just started playing violin, and uh, it was a it was a sort of lecture concert, as I remember. And I, you were able to sit. It wasn't in a concert hall. It was just in like a a room. So I grew up in the Bay Area. In, in California and I think they were visiting Stanford or something so we went into this room and we were able to sit right at their feet and right at the feet of the violinist and so I was looking right up at the violinist and I just distinctly remember that view and the way that that sounded. I'm pretty sure they played the Dumkey Trio that's what I'm remembering by Dvorak and so whether I was aware that that was classical music or not I was completely blown away by that and I guess the rest is history. Did you start as Suzuki? I did not start with the Suzuki method. I started with the Suzuki books, but my teacher had a different sort of holistic method of teaching that was not directly influenced by Suzuki. Were your parents musically inclined? Yeah, my parents are are musically inclined. They are not professional musicians. My dad used to dabble with the saxophone. My mom dabbles in flute, but... Um, nothing, nothing serious. They are, however, great lovers of music. And you know, my dad has an in incredible CD and record collection. And so there was always music going on in the house um, of, of many different genres. So I've been steeped in music for sure. And so you started playing at four. You went through school taking private instructions? Yeah, so uh, I started off when I was four, actually. Um, with private lessons. And I was always, always in youth orchestras also. I think that's an important facet of my upbringing. This aspect of collaboration has always been at the forefront of my life in music. I feel very grateful that I was brought up in this particular area, which is very fertile with lots of youth orchestras. And so I was in this, this orchestra that was basically a you know, multi-tiered um, youth orchestra from the time I was six years old. And they had multiple levels of orchestras and you kind of worked your way up to the top. And then there's a fabulous San Francisco Symphony Youth Orchestra, which is attached to the symphony. Um, the youth orchestra kind of commandeers the symphony's space on Saturdays for four hours. 
every Saturday you have a sectional for an hour and then three hours of full orchestra rehearsal. That was uh, just incredibly fulfilling and, and thrilling. You know, the first time I think most of us had ever played in a concert hall that's world-class um, like that. And uh, we, we had coachings from the musicians of the symphony and, and just such uh, incredibly integrated um, curriculum basically with, uh, with the symphony. So, so that was very formative for me. And I, I joined that youth orchestra, I think when I, was, when I started high school. So that definitely um, kind of cemented my desire to, to pursue music professionally. So there wasn't any point during that period of time where you said, nah, I'm not going to do this. Yeah, I guess not. You know, there's, um, it's been kind of interesting with COVID because I feel like my, my life progression with music has been very organic and it's kind of been, you know, one thing after another, one thing leads to another. I loved music. So I, went to the youth, or youth orchestra. I loved music, so I did chamber music in the summers, and that led to me going to conservatory, and that led to me, you know, pursuing other things because I, I loved this, uh, doing this. And, and one interesting about, one interesting thing about COVID is that I feel like I've had a, a chance to kind of step back for the first time and say, you know, why why am I, do <laughs> why am I doing this, you know, for the very first time in my life? And that's, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been a journey for sure. I, I wouldn't say I've uh, really, I don't know, come to the conclusion that uh, there's nothing else in my life that I would want to pursue. But, but it's definitely also caused me to realize how, how beautiful music is in my life. And, you know, it's, it's definitely the thing that eclipses all else. You went to conservatory where? In Boston, New England Conservatory. When did you graduate from there? Uh, 2015. Given your experience with COVID, and I assume some kind of interference with your career goals, have you reestablished career goals for yourself? Yeah, I don't know. The, the the word career, I think, has a funny connotation during this time for me, you know, considering that um, back in March, it's like one thing after another just vanished. I, I had um, a schedule where I was lucky enough to be traveling practically every week um, the past few years. And that schedule was due to continue March 2020. April, May, June, etc. And I, I remember thinking like, uh, you know, of course we were all, we all didn't know what to do in March. We didn't know how long this was gonna last. Um, and still like there was a lot of, um, a lot of my performances were still in the schedule intact. And it wasn't until May that the entire summer canceled, the entire fall canceled and so on and so forth. So it's kind of, uh, you know, come in, come in spurts. Um, and, and with the spurts come this realization of uh, really what we're, what we're up against here and, and um, the severity of this. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, everyone that I know has been having to kind of put everything on hold and, and reestablish what they thought was going to be their path and how it's now going to be different. I mean, I, I'm not the most optimistic person by nature. So I do feel like, um, you know, the more that this goes on, the, the harder time I, I have feeling like it's going to bounce back immediately. You know, I think it will take time and, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a blessing in disguise uh, in a way because I also feel like now there is a lot of space for, um, for me personally to think about how I want to sculpt my career. And beforehand, 
before this, I think it was it was so much go 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 that there was almost a like a breathlessness that there was no space to consider, you know, oh, I want to bring my career in a different direction. And so in that way, yeah, I've been trying to um, find more creative outlets for myself and to come up with a couple more personal projects. I am thankful that that right before this happened, I was granted a, a Borletti Butoni Trust Award to spend on some career things. Uh, and so I am using that uh, to formulate a commissioning project where I'm commissioning seven composers. Um, I'm using that partially for that and partially for some other recordings to be made. And, and so, yeah. Things are things are kind of you know the gears are turning in my head now that it, it looks like this is going to be over um, relatively soon. Uh, whatever it looks like on the, on the other side, I guess we'll we'll find out. But um, if you can think back to February, what did you think you wanted to do? Did you want to have a solo career? Did you want to um, become part of a chamber group? Did you want to join an orchestra? I um, very much have actively resisted uh, labels <laughs> in, in my life. And, and I, I feel very strongly, and, and I think maybe now even more so, but, but back in February also, I felt very strongly having a solo career or having a chamber music career or having a an orchestral career. I don't think that that you need to just have one of those things, you know, to be, to be uh, successful or to be fulfilled. And and for me, I have found, you know, what success I've found in diversifying my my activities and and in really pursuing what I love and playing with whom I love to play with uh, and. You know, I will always love playing a Beethoven string quartet. Um, I'll always love playing a Beethoven symphony. I'll always love playing the Beethoven violin concerto. You know, these things I'll always love um, commissioning and premiering a new work by a friend. Like these things I think have not traditionally been, uh, been part of just one career. You know, most people segment themselves into, into just one thing, but I don't think it has to be so. And I, I think after COVID, you know, the pigeonholing holing, I think will probably cease to be so important also. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, in a way, I, I love doing things that, that just follow my, my heart, I guess. You talked a bit about uh, some of your recording projects, which there's ample evidence of on YouTube. Did you produce those all yourself? For example, when you were out in the um, estate in, I think it was, was it Sonoma? Oh, yeah, yeah. Were you able to hire somebody to do the time lapse or did you do the time lapse? Well, uh, I did that time lapse. I just set that up with my phone. Um, and then I have like a pretty legit microphone that I was able to, to just record off of. So that's... Uh, you know, all of those videos that, that you might see on YouTube that are my own arrangements of things that have been done during COVID, that's all just self-produced um, with my own equipment.
the sort of larger thing that I was doing at that estate in Sonoma, um, which will hopefully be released in the month or two, is a uh, it's a it's a professional video with drones and cool things and uh, close up shots and so so there's a crew for that and that actually is sort of the music video to go along with a release of uh, a piece that I premiered by my friend Paul Wianco last year. Actually, I was very lucky to, to record that piece. I think it was February 23rd, 2020. <laughs> so right before everything, everything shut down. And I, I'm very excited for that to be released um, with the video and it'll be on all streaming platforms and uh, so forth. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal piece of music for solo violin. What's the name of it? It's called X Suite for solo violin by Paul Wianco. Um, it's uh, inspired by a set of Baroque dances, as you would find in, you know, a Bach suite or a suite by Vesthoff or you know somebody in the Baroque period. So it has like an allemand and a prelude and uh, courant and a bourree, but it's completely modern style. And it's it's cool when, um, you know, I know the composer very well. He's a, a really close friend of mine. And it's amazing when like you see your friend's genius <laughs> come out. He really like created some new techniques for violin. And I'm not exaggerating that. I didn't think that was possible, but he's created some techniques I have never seen before for solo violin, which is um, thrilling. So when you say new techniques, are you talking about actual playing techniques? Yeah, so so for example, uh, there's a movement entitled canon, right? So a canon is two voices, which one voice does something, and then a time later, the next voice does the same thing and kind of catches up to it. So it's a duo for two for two things delayed in time. And what he's done with that idea is said, well, we have two voices, let's put the two voices on two strings. And basically it's all held notes. So uh, held unisons on the D and the G string that one after another, uh, one voice follows the other. So, so I mean, it's, it's actually an incredibly simple concept, just a canon, but for solo violin. So I've seen canons for two instruments. I've seen, you know, like there's a lot of canons in existence, but sure. I've never seen one for solo violin where the notes are held all the time. It's just a, a really a beautiful concept. And it's over, it's on two staffs, even though it's for one instrument. Did you find it a challenge to learn that? Yeah. Um, and it's funny because when I approached him, asking him to write it. Uh, he wrote it for my Wigmore Hall um, recital debut last couple years ago. Uh, when I approached him to write it, he, he was like, I don't know if I can do solo violin. Like he's a cellist, but I think for so many composers, the idea of writing for solo violin is quite daunting because first of all, there's so much literature and so much history for solo violin, we have the Bach sonatas partitas, the Isai sonatas, Pagnini caprices, you know, you name it, there's a ton written for solo violin, including a lot in the last few years. And so it's it's a daunting challenge to approach, approach that with a sense of novelty. But also since he's a cellist, I think for solo violin, it's, it's very difficult because we don't have a low bass sound, right? So harmony and creating a sense of space and register and voicing is just notoriously difficult. I found it a struggle to learn in a way because he had invented these new things in order to come up with something that made sense to him that was new. And of course, when you're approaching new things, um, they start out being difficult. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was a uh, it was just, it, it's, a, it's such a rewarding thing though to, to learn a piece and ultimately for me to record that piece uh, by somebody who is, who is such a dear friend. Did he figure out the fingerings independent of you? 
or did you have to come in and say, well, no, that's not going to work? No, he he's kind of a, a savant, I would say. He plays violin, sort of. He plays it on his lap like a cello. <laughs> like he has a violin that he can, he can, so, so he knows how to finger things, basically. And it's funny because uh, a few months before the premiere, he sent me the, the sheet music. And then about a couple weeks after that, he sent me a recording of the piece. And um, I was initially kind of annoyed because I was like, you know, who had their hands on this piece before me? It sounds amazing. And he was like, no, that's, that's just me. Like, just, uh, you know, I, I edited it like crazy, but you know, I, I just did it like in my bedroom. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. So yeah, he's uh, he's kind of a genius. When you did the Inesco octet, how did you get it all coordinated? I was using one of those uh, video editors, like um, you can use Adobe Premiere. I think yeah. I used Movavi, which is a, yeah. another program. <laughs> then that was like my first foray into into doing the multi-track thing which I think a lot of us uh had had to do at the beginning or thought was fun at the beginning apparently you recorded it using your phone because it seems to be important yeah. yes yeah that one was just it was like I had that idea because I love that piece and I was bored and you might be able to see like the the sun changing, like the light changes through. <laughs> so I just did it like in the span of an hour or so. Did you have to do adjustment on the tempi at all in order to be sure it was all together or were you so spot on <laughs> you didn't need to do it? So I, I actually recorded the first violin part and then recorded, and then I had that in my ear, recorded the other parts with that playing in my ear. If I had to do it over again, I think what I've what I have learned is that that method doesn't really work. Things rhythms and tempos and stuff become a little bloated and wonky. I have learned that you should put a click track in your ear instead of just a part, you know. So if I had to do that over again, I would do that. But those those multi-track videos kind of lost their luster for me after literally everyone started doing them. <laughs> mm -hmm. 400 voices all Yes, together, yeah. yes. Entire yeah. orchestras, like Mahler yeah, yeah. 8. For, yeah. I've always been interested since the pandemic of this whole notion of reimagining. Any thoughts on that? Yes, many, many thoughts. It's something that has to be done very carefully and very thoughtfully. This sort of marriage of, of music and aesthetics. You know, of course, like we are not opera and we're not something that, that inherently comes with a visual component. And I think to, to make too much of the visual component can detract from uh, a deeper listening experience. That said, when you think about going to a classical music concert, there is actually a lot of aesthetic experience that is put into that event. But a lot of it is like so traditional and so expected that we don't think about it. Reimagining the concert experience, I think more often than not has come with the sort of desire to like coolify things for a hipper audience, you know? And like that, it usually falls flat because, you know, people are thinking that, oh, others want this experience to be a certain way or like, oh, we really want, you know, people really want to 
to chat and like have beers while they listen to Beethoven or whatever. But I mean, I think inherently what I love about a concert experience is like in its best form is when you can feel an audience enraptured with an artist. And that sort of intimate connection is something, intimate connection in silence is something that I think we should take as a priority. And, you know, I'm not saying that, that visuals have no place in the concert hall. I do think that, that for instance, lighting is something that people have not experimented with nearly enough. It's such a simple thing that can make or break, transform completely a setting or an atmosphere. And I just think that uh, it's something that, that I would like to think about more in my life of how to achieve that really deep experience for audience and performer alike. That might involve shaving off some of the traditional elements that we usually have, have come to expect in a concert setting or not. But, but I think as long as we approach it with um, intention and, and that sort of priority in mind, that's the way forward to me. So often I think that I've, I've been so frustrated in this pandemic, seeing all this content, which people have spent, you know, orchestras are spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars on producing this content. And they, the, the videographers or the cinematographers, not by any fault of their own, but maybe they don't have experience with classical music or they're hired to, to do this with, without a knowledge of the score most times. And, you know, the orchestra doesn't hire a producer to, to tell them, oh, the camera needs to be on the flute instead of the cello. And so what, what ends up happening is you have like 12 cameras that are cutting back and forth to like, you know, all the, the 12 like people with, uh, who are like doing tremolos and unimportant stuff. And, and it's, it's seeming to say like, oh, you know, classical music is so exciting. And here it's like, it's, it's just, um, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it, it just seems so contrary to, to what it is, you know, and it, it's actually, for me, incredibly distracting to what I, I know the music could be. <laughs> I think, uh, I think we in classical music are, are still in a, in a corner of, <laughs> of conservative, uh, conservative thought, and it's hard to, it's hard for us to break out of that sometimes. You know, one of the other things that I would say uh, in response to some of your observations, classical music is not easy. For the most part, it requires a lot of attention for somebody to dedicate two hours to listening to a piece of complicated music is actually asking a lot of people. Yeah. We don't do a good job anymore of training people's attention spans. In fact, we do just the opposite. We try to make scenes short and fast and move quickly from one cut to another cut. And so we don't really foster that kind of attention. And I don't ever want to be one of those people who say, well, it used to be. But in fact, it, I think it was different. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I, I'm guilty of that also in, 
in my non-classical music life, you know, I, <laughs> I think we all are with our, with our phones and swiping constantly through this and that, not reading whole articles, rather watch a little video that summarizes the article than read the multi-paragraph news article. You know, all of these things are, are just contributing to what you're saying, I think. Even going into a concert hall is kind of a nice uh, rep uh, reprieve from doing that. Yeah. And I, I know that there are some concert halls who have tried to integrate the cell phone into the concert. And I've actually thought, well, maybe that is a way to go where people could read their program notes on the phone and they could ask questions and all that. But all those things are distractions. Those aren't about really enjoying the music. Uh, well, I also, I mean, to go along with that, I, I must say I kind of have a problem with program notes in general <laughs> or the fact that there's, there is a booklet in every concert. I'm guilty of this in concerts where there's maybe a, a commissioned piece and it's hard to understand and you pull out the program note and you, you want to read about it or you want to look at who's donated $50,000 to the organization <laughs> recently. <laughs> you know, like there's so many, so many things to look at, uh, but, but as long as there's something to look at during a concert, I think it, I don't know if, th if this is a bad, if, if this is bad of me to think, but like there's, all, there's gonna be a, an excuse to be distracted. I, I don't know, I believe like I'm thinking about for one of my projects is instead of a program note, instead of, or I mean, maybe you email a program note to the audience after the concert or before the concert or something. But instead of a program booklet um, with notes, uh, this is for my commissioning project. I feel like having a portrait of the artist, especially for a living composer, you know, people want to know who these people are. You don't want to just hear a, hear a piece and it's abstract and you hear it once and it's like, well, I don't know if I got that. So whatever, I, I won't listen to it again. So to have portraits that are artfully done, video portraits to be shown in between pieces, projected during the concert, something that's thoughtful, something that's in lieu of the composer coming up and speaking about his or her piece, which I find sometimes to be not deep enough compared to to what I think the piece is deserving of because the composer might be nervous or you know this or that. So I don't know, finding creative solutions to helping people not be distracted during the performance, but also to integrating some more 21st century life into the concert hall via videos. I think that's a very simple way to do things that could also be done thoughtfully. I have always felt also that when there's a world premiere, it should never be played just once because odds are it's never going to be played again anyway. So Say that. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. So uh, sadly, you're right. It's probably a good thing to play the piece twice, maybe once at the beginning of the concert, once at the end of the concert. But see, the thing is that I very much have a problem with the way things are programmed, especially with regards to contemporary music. I think still people just try to check boxes. The the lack of creative solutions to programming, I think is also directly involved in people's dismissal of contemporary music, dismissal of premieres, the lack of premieres being played more often than they are. If you're not going to treat the piece with thoughtfulness and respect, then yeah, probably people aren't going to enjoy it as much as they would if it were thoughtfully integrated and programmed in a cool way and given a ton of attention, people's tastes can can change and people can be exposed to things and bad word, but trained to, you know, to enjoy different things. And yet with pop music, you never really have to have anybody explaining the music. You go in, you hear it once and you got it. But classical music is not pop music. It's much more complicated. It's a very different kind of experience. I know you've soloed with a lot of orchestras. Is there one that stands out in your mind? It actually got into this spirit of trying to do it different. Yes, although I would I would put a couple caveats on this because um, I think the the orchestra that comes to mind immediately is the Mahler Chamber Orchestra, which is first off 
European orchestra. There's a lot more willingness to experiment in Europe, probably partially because they're not as privately funded as we are um, for a whole host of reasons. And also they are a very small ensemble. They're self-governed. They don't have a home, the Mahler Chamber Orchestra, so they are a touring ensemble only, which means that um, from the projects that I've been involved with them, they have an extreme sense of, of wanting to make it work and, want, and being excited to be there because every time is in a new location. So I think it's easier in Europe and it's easier to be a chamber orchestra because it's more flexible it's with a smaller, smaller ensemble to do things a little out of the box. But I, yeah, I have found with them that there's just a true open-mindedness and they have like five artistic partners each season. Um, and the artistic partners are in residence for three years or so. And they come back and are involved in curating um, in tandem with the group, uh, a bunch of projects that they're involved with. This at one point um, included Pekka Kusisto, who's a violinist. And he came to them and they did a whole performance of Pauline Oliveros um, going in and out of other played things. But Pauline Oliveros piece was more uh, experiential. So the orchestra put down their instruments for a time and acted out. So they're, they're willing to do things like that. But even just musically, I think the fact that they don't often have a conductor also sometimes brings everyone into the fold a little bit better and makes it feel like chamber music truly. So everyone has a voice, everyone has this feeling of, of wanting to make it work and responsibility. You know, as, as hard as we might try, I don't think that classical music is ever going to reach beyond our little niche. And I think in a way we have to come be at peace with that. I always say that like my interviews instead of going viral, they go bacterial. It's kind of like a <laughs> slow growing infection. You know, it'll eventually get there, but boy, it sure takes a long time. Excellent. Thank you so much. Hey, nice good to talking meet you. with you, enjoyed it. Yeah, You Likewise. take care of yourself. Thank you.